And then how did this project come to be? How did the whole thing come together? Well, this, this is all a result of the Covenant Foundation, uh, which is an organization that uh, funds Jewish education. And I actually did a project for them. I was a part of a group of artists that created uh, you know, short uh, time-based pieces. And uh, in one of those Covenant-funded projects, I started doing Jewish text study that was part of the project. And I started discovering then um, all of this immense wisdom in the Jewish texts. And I approached Covenant with this idea of doing this series. And they you know, went completely out of the box, took a huge risk with this project, and it's been uh, immensely successful. I'm in indebted to the Covenant Foundation. Um, and in particular, Harleen Appleman and Joni Blunderman, who really became my mentors uh, over this project. And they gave you a major award, yes? I, they gave me a major grant, a three-year grant, a signature grant, um, and I was able to take a year off from my teaching job and really focus on studies and on the animation. Um, and then this exhibit uh, was curated by Laura Kruger and Jeannie Rosensoft, the director of this museum, and Laura Kruger uh, have always been immense supporters of my artwork. And when they saw this series of animations that I made uh, and the artwork associated with it, they immediately offered me a solo show. So I'm equally indebted to them. Um, and uh, uh, of course, there's a, a wonderful catalog that's online as well. Hanan, mm -hmm. sitting in front of these, um, you know, these pages look like pages of a graphic novel. It looks to me like they're all about conversation. And there's something just so Jewish about that idea of learning through people talking to each other. Um, yet, every time I look at them, you know, you learn something a little bit more and you go deeper. Maybe talk about how the whole process of doing animation um, works in this context and how, that you, how you really bring depth to it. The learning process about these, these teachings has always been a conversation between me and my teachers. You know, they would refer me to books, but then I would read something in the book and immediately be filled with all of these questions and then go back to the different teachers that I would be studying with, and it would lead to these very, very in-depth conversations. And once I felt like I had been able to, you know, understand the teachings as much as I could, I then decided that the best vehicle to convey the teachings would again be through a conversation. So in each of the animations and in the graphic novel, you know, pages, uh, it's a conversation between me and my father, me and my father and mother. Now, were these the conversations that you actually had with your dad or the kind of conversations you had with your dad? One of the episodes, the third episode on gratitude, that was almost word for word a conversation. But most of the, most of the animations actually uh, feature uh, conversations that I invented. Um, so, you know, I use uh, the mannerisms and the Israeli accents of my parents, um, and I use their, just their, their, their way of speaking, um, but the actual content of what they're saying was, was scripted by me for most of the animations, yes. And how did they feel when, they, when they've seen these? They loved it. It makes them look really good. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's, it's really complicated. I want, like, putting all this together, like, what were the challenges for you in, in creating this? So the animated series was a three-year project. Um, and by far the biggest challenge was when I proposed the project, I had no idea how intensive the research would be. You know, I thought I would go to a rabbi and say, well, what are the teachings on gratitude? And I would write them down and make an animation. I found that I had to study and study and study. And one rabbi would send me another rabbi, and another one would contradict the first. And, and the, the, they would give me one thing to read and another thing to read. And then I would have all these questions, and then it would change my mind. So each animation would involve three to four months of study before I even began, you know, the script writing and the animation. And I literally would have to force myself to stop the study and say, okay, I'm going to have to just make an animation with the teachings I have. So it felt like the longer I studied, um, the more complicated and the less I knew. <laughs> Uh, and then how do you actually do it? Like, what's the process of, do you do the drawings first? Do you do the writing? Do you? I write the scripts. Um, and I rewrite the scripts, and I read the scripts to people, and I rewrite them and rewrite them. Once I have the script finalized, I record the script. Um, I edit the audio so that it's perfect, because of course I do my father and my mother's voices, and then I, you know, uh, edit it so that it seems like you know an actual conversation. Um, and then I begin the painstaking animation. Now the voices are great. Did you grow up imitating your parents? I did, 
Um, and I never knew that it would lead to my artistic career. Um, you know, I used to make fun of them. Um, and uh, their voices are just still inside my head all the time. So it's something. And, you know, whenever I pass someone who's Israeli, you know, I, I hear that kind of sing song um, in the voice and I immediately, uh, you know, think of my parents. There's also like a lot of motion. You're often sitting in a car, sitting on a train. Do you think those lead to better to a certain kind of conversation? Very much so. I think that a car, most of them take place in a car. And I, th I think that there's, there's something about driving in a car where um, you are going somewhere. So there's kind of like, there's a journey. You know, you're involved in a journey. Um, but you're also kind of trapped together. You know, whether you like it or not, you can't escape the conversation. You're just kind of with that person from the beginning till the end, and, and that's it. Hanan, I love all of these, but I particularly, like, faith really spoke to me, and I really was moved by that. Um, and it, it's kind of an unusual take on faith. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with this? The goal was always to make these teachings very, very accessible and a non-preachy and, and not overtly religious. But I knew that the last episode would always be faith, and faith sounds, how do you make faith not religious? So this was a big challenge for me. Um, and uh, I had to kind of find a way with my teachers to speak about something as profound as faith without sounding preachy or religious, and I, I'm, I'm happy with the way it came out. But you really very easily go back and forth between, you know, faith being in the present and things that are quite profound, and then you make it very real when you talk about, you know, your father telling you, you know, didn't you remember when you were a little boy, Hanan, and you always knew I would come home, but you had faith, but sometimes I didn't. Right, right. So um, there are a couple of things about faith that I learned that I think are really moving for me. Um, the first one is, is in the religious view, uh, in the Jewish view of faith, at least as I understand it, um, it's not just about a trust or a hope or a belief, but it's also about action. You know, there's, there's something about the actual moment where you're making a decision, where you're actually moving forward and doing something, and you do that with an act of faith, this, this is, um, it's this very intentional, conscious, connected, aware idea. And, and I think that that's, there's something really lovely about it. It's not sitting back and saying, okay, everything's going to be taken care of. You're an active part of this, and you're basically saying, and sometimes that's going to mean that things are still going to go wrong. That's okay. It doesn't change the, the fact that in the moment you, you did it with an act of faith. And just a really interesting anecdote, I was speaking recently to a rabbi who was telling me about the famous story of Nachshon, that when the Red Sea parted, um, you know, that first someone had to step inside the water before the sea parted, so there's, there's this action involved. Well, this rabbi was extending it and saying, part of it is that, you know, sometimes we're going to jump in the water and realize the sea isn't going to part and we're going to have to swim back to shore. It doesn't change the fact that in that moment we're, we're, we're taking the action with, you know, a certain uh, decisive but yet filled with hope and trust and belief. So I, I see that as, as a very tangible um, and useful, pragmatic way, approach to faith. That can and be used where's like God in this? Um, for me, God is there, God is inside of all of us. But I think once you start talking about God, it becomes a very individual approach. You know, everyone relates to God in a different way. And, you know, even if someone says, well, I base my belief of God on the Torah and the Talmud, there are so many takes in the Torah and the Talmud on God. So, um, you know, I think that once you step into that arena, it becomes very um, tricky. Um, and instead, I wanted to take the parts of faith that I felt were very um, utilitarian, very, very uh, pragmatic in our daily lives. And I don't think that my approach negates God at all. I think it's filled with, with God. I just don't, you know, specifically call it that. Can you give a sense of who some of these teachers were, who you consulted, I mean, who the sources are? That yes. So um, my, my two main, main teachers were Maoz and Tali Kahana. The Kahanas are, are in Israel. Um, Maoz and Tali Kahana really are the ones that showed me how much uh, love there is in Judaism and how much 
uh, it focuses on the potential of the human being um, as opposed to something that is, you know, shaming and judgmental. Um, but there were many, many other uh, teachers, Joe Septimus, a Talmudic scholar, William Berkson, a philosopher. But you're, you're mentioning all these wonderful live teachers, but I look back and it looks like you have teachers, you know, going back centuries. So who are some of the other sources that you consulted? Of course. So um, uh, Hillel, uh, a lot of Hillel, uh, a lot of Rambam, um, uh, a lot of Rav Kook, um, uh, a huge influence, one of the biggest, were the writings of uh, Rabbi Nachman. Can you give an example of a... What Rabbi Nachman said, one of his famous lines is, life is a narrow bridge. The main thing is not to be afraid. And so the question is, how do you understand this line? And the way it was explained to me was, uh, if you have to walk along this very narrow path, um, it's not difficult. You focus on just walking on this narrow path from getting from one point to the other. Um, but if you knew that on the left and the right of that path was, you know, a pit with alligators, suddenly you'd be very, very afraid, even though the path itself is the same path. So meaning a lot of the times, you know, we, we live our lives worried about all of these dangers and pitfalls, and we live our lives that way. When in actuality, if we just focus on the bridge, if we just focus you know, on this pathway that we're on um, and not focus on all of those fears, um, it's actually a healthier way. And ultimately, it doesn't, it, the reality is still the same. We still have the same pathway to walk on. So that's one of the teachings. What about the humor? I mean, your, your father is really funny. <laughs> so I used to make very, very dark artwork. And, um, you know, uh, people were just very depressed looking at it. And I found that a lot of people don't want to go very deep and they don't want to go very dark. They just kind of like, you know, sitcoms and the <laughs> cartoons and they like that. What I found, though, in watching, for example, The Simpsons is that, you know, they could have a cartoon uh, with, I think, Itchy and Scratchy or whatever are the characters, and they're doing these horrific things, but because it's in a cartoon and Bart and Lisa are laughing at it, somehow people can digest it. So I found that through humor and through cartoons, you can actually go much deeper and much darker and much more serious, um, and people ingest it because humor just makes it all easy. So looking at forgiveness, which I feel like is also just really powerful, and I somehow seeing that, it just it really changes something. Like um, there's one line that people keep repeating. I don't know if we can talk about that yes, or even give it. Mm -hmm. So about paying rent, can you talk about that? So uh, one of the rabbis that I really wanted to study with but didn't get to meet, unfortunately, maybe he'll hear this, uh, this interview and and uh, let me meet him, uh, is Rabbi Abraham uh, Tversky. And Rabbi Tversky, uh, I just kept reading book after book after book, at least seven books from cover to cover. Um, and his approach to Judaism, first of all, he's in a long line of uh, rabbis descending, I believe, from the Baal Shem Tov. Um, and uh, so he, you know, he has this Hasidic background, but he's also a medical doctor and a psychiatrist and opened up a, a clinic for addiction. Um, so his approach in Judaism is very, very, again, pragmatic um, and very human. Uh, Judaism anyway is human, but this is just really, really gets to the heart. So he is the one who spoke about um, anger and these kind of three uh, stages of anger. Um, and I'll just jump to the last stage, which is how long we hang on to anger, the resentment. And he made the analogy of, you know, when you're not forgiving someone, when you're holding on to some kind of wrong, you're actually letting somebody live rent-free inside of your head. And I decide I've got, to, I've got to use that line. And I credited him and at the end of the animation. I actually said that I, I took that analogy directly from him. And um, uh, people have been, you know, coming up to me and writing to me saying that that line has changed their lives. So I refer them back to Rabbi Abraham Tversky. Okay. Kanan, it's one thing to look at these in a museum and they look really great. Um, the size is really great, but you can also look at them online and that's a really different experience. And then isn't there something like you can actually click and go right to the teachings? How does, how does that work? Right. So um, the website is jewishfoodforthought.com. And that has all of the animations on it. And next to each animation 
is a study guide um, written by Rabbi Leor Kay. And um, you can basically click on that, and it opens up a PDF that you can print out with a study guide. And it has, um, you know, Jewish text sources and many of the teachings from the animations. And then, of course, the animations themselves, they're on the website, but they, they're they are in YouTube. So they can be embedded on any website, uh, and they've been embedded on, you know, a whole slew of websites uh, ranging. Anyway. Good. And let's talk a little about um, humility. That yes. one, I think, will also, your take on humility will really surprise people. Yeah, it surprised me. It surprised you. How did you come to understand humility in this way? Um, so uh, Rabbi Nachman um, was explaining that when you're humble, when you're below, when you're like the dust, when you're like the earth, um, people might think of that as something that is very... Um, a bad and disempowering, but in actuality, he says the earth has gravitational pull, and it draws things to it. So when you're low, you actually draw people to you. When you insist on being above everybody, people run away from you. They don't want to be near you. And he also explains that the earth, that's where plants grow inside of the earth. So the earth is really nurturing. So by being low and humble, you can actually nurture the growth of others, um, which is a wonderful feeling. But then immediately people say, well, if they're growing, people think of it as they're getting a piece of the pie and I'm not getting a piece of the pie. That's not the case. When, the, when a plant grows inside of the earth, the earth expands with the plant. So the earth grows uh, and becomes more nourished with, with, with the plant. So that's the same way when you're humble and people grow as a, as a result of your uh, n nurturing and nourishment, you also grow with them in, in many ways a deeper way. And the teachings go on and on. So I, I tried to put as many of those Rabbi Nachman teachings on humility. I found those so beautiful and really make me think of my own life and my approach to life in a, in a different way. So, Hanan, you said maybe through the process you've become more observant. Yes. I wonder in what other ways has this really changed your, your life? It's changed my life completely. <laughs> I, I realized that every approach that I was taking towards succeeding or moving forward or, uh, you know, growing was, was actually not only not effective, but counter-effective. And through the Jewish teachings, I realized um, a new take on humility, a new take, for example, I'll give you an example, a really tangible example, uh, the take on love. Um, you know, when I would talk to my friends about love, somebody that they were dating or someone, it was always about this kind of calculation, you know, what, what, what do they have to offer? You know, what are their pros and their cons? People make a list of what they want in a relationship, and does the person meet that list or not? Um, you know, maybe not literally a list, but, you know, people are thinking, oh, and, and he's a doctor, and he has this, and, you know, and the same thing, you know, we would make these lists. So uh, in the Jewish take on love, it's not about receiving. It's entirely about giving. And it's not in giving in order to get something in exchange. It's literally just about giving. You're just giving for the sake of giving because you want to give. And this approach, associating it with love, that loving is giving, was beforehand alien to me. And, but once I started learning about it and made the animation about it, it made so much sense. And then I started seeing that the relationships in my life that really are the most lasting and the most meaningful and the most unconditional they always involve in there uh, uh, an aspect where I was giving for the sake of giving, without expecting something in return. Um, and uh, even though it's, it's difficult to do these teachings and you have to consciously work on them, they actually work. So um, uh, my approach of trying to take teachings that would be very pragmatic to one's life I've used them in my own life, and they've changed my life 100%. And were you always so positive and energetic, or does that also come from these teachings? Oh, usually I'm much more hyper. I'm trying to stay still for the camera. Uh, but I've always been very energetic. Uh, I don't know if positive, you know, I'm, I, I'm usually a, a big worrier, um, but always very energetic and, and hyper, and I try to use that to my advantage. Well, um, I would like to thank you so much for taking the time to interview me and for the beautiful article that you wrote in the Jewish Week. Um, you're a brilliant interviewer and a brilliant writer and just a wonderful person. So it's, it's been such a privilege to spend time with you and get to know you and thank you so much. Thank you, Hanan. I think, you know, for me too, I think it really, these pieces really change one's life. And I think that's true for viewers and people who are looking at it, you know, in all kinds of contexts. So you've really done a great service to all of us. So I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.